Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show, a program dedicated to bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you won't hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as He is commanded in Ephesians 5.11. Now here's your host, Good Fight Ministries' own Chad Davidson. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. With me, as always, the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Seam Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Very well in Jesus, brother. Amen, amen. Slight pause, but Tony, <laughs> how are you doing today, our show's producer? I'm doing awesome in the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. We are so excited to talk on this Typology Tuesday. Guys, we... we uh, Got a little, I don't want to say off course because Joe still went into typology, and I think he went a little typology on Thursday as well last week, but we wanted to make sure we got into this subject because it's really important. We want to stay on this. We're going to continue going into this because I know one of Joe's passions, one of Tony's passion, one of my passion is that you guys would be excited about scripture, and I would say if I chose just one, okay, just one typology to go through, and I said this is the one. There's there's a 50-50 shot that it would be this one or Joseph, okay? Yeah, yeah. It would be this one or Joseph. They're right up there. And yeah. I will say this. Uh, one of the last times I was in Israel sharing the gospel, this one and Joseph both is what I use to present the gospel to someone. So it's really, really important to me. And I'll tell you this. The first time I ever heard about this was not from being at the message, but a friend of mine was at the message. I At that time, when I first came to the Lord, I was going to church here, but on Wednesday nights, I had class until 9 p.m., so I wasn't able to get to church. But after church, I would talk to my friend, and he would bring me the CD, and we would talk about the notes and say, hey, what was going on? And he came back, and he's like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like, the gospel being preached <laughs> like in Genesis before Jesus came because I was just understanding at that time. I mean, it was like maybe a month into my salvation and I'm like, I was just understanding what the Old Testament was or the New Testament was, what the covenants had to do with anything, who wrote what. And so I'm like, oh man, this is crazy. I can't wait to check this out. And then I, I got a chance to listen to the tape and I know for Tony, it was an impact for you as well, correct? Oh yeah, this was, uh, this typology is the one when I went through it when I was just starting to get interested in things of a religious nature, this is the story that grabbed me. And that's actually the point I got saved. And I didn't even really understand it until I continued to read the scriptures. And then when I looked back at this typology, I'm like, that is exactly what God was speaking to me through. Because my family is, you know, Jewish. So to me, it made sense. Like, wow, God, he, he grabbed my heart in the Old Testament with this story. And the typology was just so rich. Once once I came across what it actually meant with Jesus and what he did, I, I was just blown away. Yeah, amen, amen. That's praise the Lord. And and I know we've uh, if you if you just to revert back, guys, go listen to Tony's testimony as well uh, because he mentions this at well at a little more yep. length. Um, the, and it's one of the first three episodes. Uh, the first episode is Joe's testimony, second one's mine, and then the third one's Tony. So guys, please go check that out. You guys would be totally blessed by that. And and guys, this this is why we really love this because you can only see, guys, only, period, especially when you think about God's providence over everything, all right, God's providence over time, space, and matter, people, and everything, you really, you have to have that. The liberal Christianity gets thrown and flushed down the toilet when you understand how clear it is Absolutely. that God spoke from Genesis through Revelation with one specific detailed description, okay, of how salvation would come and in the form of Revelation, how it came, okay? And guys, when you dig into this and when you see this, you can't get around it. This is, by and large, so clearly being taught, this is the word of God to us. This is Theonostoth. This is God breathed onto paper. This is exactly what God intended for us to learn through the scriptures. So I'm so excited because as we talked about in the first message, if you guys haven't heard through the typology messages we go to, go to the introductory where Joe talks about the burning in the heart of those on the road of Emmaus, mm. okay, on the road to Demaeus, when he, when Jesus came and spoke to them and made their hearts burn after giving them this study. So, praise God, Joe. No, and that's a great intro, too, because 
when Jesus uh, was showing himself in the scriptures, the Psalms, and the, you know the prophets and the law, it's very likely he went to this passage. And I say that because what was he doing? He was showing them his resurrection. And this is a great picture of Jesus' resurrection, not just his death. You know, as much as as important as his death is uh, for our sins, we sometimes we overlook the fact that he had to rise again and he rose again and to you know uh, the newness of life. And it's a picture of the resurrection that we have in him, and he did it for us for our justification. It says, but it's interesting. Uh, I've been teaching this for man, I don't even know how many years. In fact, Tony, I don't know if you remember, but you guys did a song I wrote, uh, Abraham, yeah. yep. Abraham. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Yeah. You know, and uh, <laughs> keep I singing, get, keep singing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not much of a singer, but uh, and uh, it, it's a beautiful song though, and it was one of I wrote it on my acoustic guitar, and uh, heartbreaking because you know it, it captures Isaac being or Abraham being called to give his son, and, and the emotion, you know, that the pain that he had to have uh, experienced. But he's a picture of the father, and I love it when we see typologies and and we we're just blown away pictures because think again guys we're not just talking i love direct prophecies you know that you know uh, that specifically talk about you know that he'll be born in bethlehem or you know he'll be cut off from the land of the living and you know he'll be despised by his own people i love those uh but there's something special about prophecies where god sovereignly in his providence and you have to have a very very high view of god's providence and sovereignty to to really comprehend that he's actually using human events and using people's lives to make a picture and foreshadow the future of the God of the gospel, the future of what he's going to do with his son. It's just mind blowing when you think that way, because he's so powerful that he uses the free decisions of people, right? He orchestrates them in such a way where they're choosing, but he uses the, them in such a way to where they show forth the gospel. And we're showing that in the days of creation uh, on on a typology Tuesday. We'll keep doing that as well. I'm looking. I'm really excited about that. But I thought, you know what? We'll have something really special today. We'll jump ahead and go through Genesis chapter 22 a little bit. But I, I love it when the New Testament verifies that this is a picture. And a lot of times in the New Testament, you might get just a couple words, or you might get a sentence, or you might get a paragraph that points out it's a type or it's a picture. But then God leaves it to us to go back and say, wow, how is this a picture, you know? And listen to this. This is in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. The Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Now, it's important. He's offered up his only begotten son. Was he his only begotten son? He was his only begotten son regarding promise, but he also had another son, and that was Ishmael. But this was the only begotten son that God had counted as the son of the covenant and the son uh, that his seed would come through, the son of promise. And it's interesting, he's called his only begotten son, because who else? <laughs> far more famous than Isaac is called an only begotten or the only begotten son, Jesus. So you're probably seeing where this is going. Uh, verse 18, it was he to whom it was said in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. So when he was called to give Isaac as a sacrifice, he's probably horrified regarding the thought. I mean, this is his only son who he loves, right? And he's like, what in the world is God calling me to do? And, you know, and this kind of tripped me out when I first read this as a brand new Christian. I read this, I thought, you know, everything I'm reading in the Bible, because Genesis is not where I started, that God's against murder, certainly against, you know, killing your kid. And I was like, what in the world's going on here? This is one of those passages that I hung on a hook, said, Lord, I don't understand what it means. I know I see through a glass darkly. You know, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I don't get it, but... I'm going to just trust you and, you know, you'll reveal it to me. What became one of the most disturbing passages in all the Bible to me as a new Christian became my favorite passage for quite some time. And it's still on rotation every once in a while. It still becomes my favorite because <laughs> I become enamored by it. And he, it says, now check this out. He considered, that is Abraham, that God is able to raise people even from the dead. So Abraham realized God's promise that my seed will come through Abraham. That means that God, he's, he could have thought he's going to stop me, but it's not what he thought. He's going, that's what God did. Or, and what he did think, was that, you know, God's going to raise him up. He already saw the power of God in his life, and he knew God was speaking to him. It was very, very clear. And he knew that he was able to rise people from the dead, so he figured that God would rise Isaac up. And it says, now this is interesting, from which also he received him back as a 
type. Catch that? Mm. That's that Greek word tupas, from which we get types and typology. We're, we're told in the book of Hebrews that Isaac, who he received back figuratively from the dead, was a type. He was a picture. He was a tupas. Who is he a picture of? Well, we already got the hints there. He's a picture of the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a picture of the fact that God would have to give his son for the sins of the world and that Jesus would rise again. Now, we go back to Genesis chapter 22. And by the way, I can't tell you how many people, and it's blessed my heart, that I've shared this with through the years. And then when they see it, their eyes, and you could just hear, you know, uh, Chad, you know, when he first saw it. I know Chad's used this over in Israel to witness with. I've used it in Israel too, to share with Jews, not only in Israel, but here in the United States, to share with non-believing Jews. How do you explain this? Because I like to show picture after picture after picture. After a while, they're like, wow, it's like the Christians wrote the Old Testament to point to Jesus. No, (laughs) God inspired it through your prophets long before the Messiah came. By the way, this happened about 2,000 years. Now, we think back almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave himself for us. But 2,000 years before Jesus, this incident took place. And I call it the first passion play. I think the first or second time I preached on this, I called it the first passion play. Because in Germany, they have this huge passion play. I, I don't even remember what the German word is for it. We almost went to it the year we went to, one of the years we went to Germany, they were actually having this passion play in a city which had been a, a, a village historically, which hundreds of years earlier had escaped a plague that had swept over Germany and just wiped out whole towns. And they cried out to God. They said, God, if you spare our town, if you spare our village, we'll do something in remembrance for the rest of our existence to give you glory. And guess what? They were spared this plague. And ever since that time, this little village in Germany, which is a more of a robust city right now, the doctors and the dentists and the shoemakers and the cobbler, who everybody gets together and they take different parts, huge uh, festivities, but they reenact the death of Christ and his resur- the passion of Christ. And they do it, I forget, you know, maybe every six years or so. It happened to be one of the years we were there, but it was just too pricey. Yeah. <laughs> so we decided, you know, we're not going to go, you know. But uh, the whole town gets involved. And it's a passion play. They reenact, you know, what, what Jesus did for us on the cross at the town. But guess what? This was reenacted. Before, well, not really reenacted. This was pre-enacted. <laughs> this was a, a, a artistic production, a pre- prophetic artistic production, as I like to call them, uh, 2,000 years before Christ. It was the first passion play. And it's interesting. Let's just go through some of the verses. And it's undeniable. And it gets you so excited about God's word, about, about Jesus and how powerful God is. Then it lets you realize, wow, God wants to be involved in my life to where I shine with Jesus. And my life shines for Jesus. And there's so many ways to look at, look at these prophetic uh, pictures. Chapter 22, verse 1 it says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son. Now, he, doesn't say, he could just say, just take your son. <laughs> yeah. You know, Ishmael's not even there anymore. He would know who he's talking about. <laughs> but God emphasizes your son, your only son. That makes it more painful, but it makes it more intimate. It makes it more personal, and it makes it more prophetic. Because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, if Isaac is a picture of the only son, Jesus If Isaac's a picture of Jesus, who's Abraham a picture of? He's a picture of the Father. And one of the things I get out of this typology, too, through the years that really blesses my heart is I get to see not only what Jesus, you know, in obedience to his Father, Isaac was obedient to his Father, but you get to see the obedience, you get to see the love of the Father for his son. And you get to see the pain that Abraham must have, the anguish that he must have had. And you get to see a little glimpse because we're a small mirrors, right? We're in the image of the Lord of the infinite loving God, the deep anguish, the deep anguish that the father had gone through must have been absolutely excruciating. So he says, take your son, your only son. Now watch this. He says, whom you love. Now, does that sound familiar? What did God say to, I mean, what Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter three, verse 17, says the heavens open and the Lord, the father, God spoke from heaven and said, uh, this is my son whom I love. By the way, the first time you see the word love, first time you see the word love in the Old Testament is right here in Genesis 22 of Abraham's love for his only son who he has to sacrifice. Guess what? The first time you see love and the word love in the New Testament 
is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, of the Father's love for his son, who he's going to sacrifice. I mean, we could almost stop right there and say, wow, these parallels are, are crazy. Well, they're awesome. But we're drawing a line, and we have the authority with great uh, assurance to draw it because of Hebrews 11, telling us that this is a type. By the way, I'll give you a couple other scriptures along those lines. Jesus said, Abraham desired to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. <laughs> Abraham was desiring to see his day? What did he, how did he? Well, guess what? You know, he was in the first Passion Play. The, the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians said that the gospel was preached ahead of time to Abraham. You see, and then we just uh, read Hebrews earlier. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I will tell you. So he wants him to go to a special mountain in a special area. Why not just take him down the road, you know? Why do it this way? Well, because guess what? The Mount Moriah, guess where that's at? That's the mountain range. That's Golgotha, Mount Calvary. If you go to Bible Maps and you go look at the mountains of Moriah, you'll see that that's where Mount Calvary is, where Jesus was crucified. Brothers and sisters, this is just like, this was written uh, about 3,500 years ago by Moses, right? Uh, and then uh, the Jews hold it in their hands this day, but not realizing what it all signifies. Still a veil. Still a veil over their eyes. It's removed in Christ. That's right, Second Corinthians 3. <laughs> yeah. And then it goes on to say, on one of the mountains of which I will tell you, God has a special mountain in mind. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, and by the way, this is all a three-day process from beginning to end. Uh, from the time Abraham realized he needed to give up his son till the time it, this ordeal ends, it's, it's, it's three days and three nights. Uh, you can put that together pretty easy. Uh, that that was, you know, the time from the time that Jesus died till he rose again. And it goes on to say in verse five, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Now, somebody might say a skeptic. Yeah, Abraham thought he was going to rise. God would rise him from the dead. Sure. That's not in the text. It's right here. <laughs> he says it right here. He says, we will worship and return to you. Okay, uh, he's letting him know that he has confidence God's going to rise him from the dead even. You know, this is all just so Amen. rich. Wish we had more time for it, but it's kind of nice going through it pretty quickly so you can hit the highlights. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and check this out. He laid it on his uh, on Isaac, his son. Brothers and sisters, what did, where did Jesus take the wood? Up to a special mountain, same mountain range. What did he, wear, what did he put on his back? He bore the cross. He bore the wood on his back. And, of course, he fell down because they had lacerated his back and uh, opened up his back with a whip and put a crown of thorns on him. And, and he was bleeding and he lost blood even in the Garden of Gethsemane before that. And he was just wiped out because he, he was truly a man, God and man. And he suffered as a man. And he laid it on his Isaac, his son. And he took his hand, uh, the, the hand of fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And it's like the fire, the knife. It's the, the, you know, he's going to, this is coming from his father, which I think is powerful uh, in regard to substitutionary or substitutionary and vicarious atonement that we actually, that Jesus actually suffered the wrath of his father, Amen. you know, which is being denied by many emergents and others today. But that's, that's an, a central part of the atonement that Jesus died for our sins and the stroke that was due us, according to Isaiah 53, the wrath that, that the, it pleased the father to crush him. So he bore the wrath of the father in our place. So it goes on to say uh, that, you know, it says uh, in the end of verse 6, it says, So the two of them walked on together, and then verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, this is very interesting. It's just like so innocent from Isaac's standpoint. He doesn't have really a clue what's going on. Uh, but guess what? He's such a picture of Jesus because Jesus was, by the way, sometimes, you know, you'll see like children's stories of this and you'll see little, a little boy, Isaac, be like I, I was thinking seven, that seven, eight years the, old the or something, right? <laughs> but you know what? Seven, eight year old boy, I could, you, you know, you're, you're I was the grandkids, say, they could barely, yeah. barely carry up one stick up the hill, right? Yep. Before they're complaining, right? He's talking, we're talking about enough wood to build a fire. So a lot of the rabbis, which is interesting, felt he was, uh, you know, they, they feel he was a grown man. 
You know, he's his son. He's his only son. And they families would live together for years, you know. And uh, he wasn't married yet, you know. And uh, many of them put him around 30 years old. We don't know exactly how old, but it's very possible he was around 33 when this happened. You know, I would doubt that, you know. By the way, Isaac is such a picture. Let's back up just for a second before the story because this blows me away too. Isaac was given his name before he was born. He was born as a part of prophecy, right? Like Jesus. It's through him that a seed would be born, would be, uh, come, you know, have life. His seed would become the Messiah and so forth. Jesus is through him that we have life. And think about this. He had to have a supernatural birth. His mother, Sarah's womb was dead. There's no way he could be born naturally. And God had to supernaturally open her womb. Sound familiar? Mary was a virgin. She couldn't have a child naturally. And she had a miraculous birth. I mean, he's a picture from the get-go. And it gets even heavier beyond this prophecy because then you get him, into him and Eliezer, a picture of the Holy Spirit, who Abraham sends to get Rebecca, which is his bride, who he decks with jewels, the gifts. And that's a picture of the church coming to Jesus, which Isaac's a picture of. And I'm going to just throw all these typologies at you too fast. And we're gonna go, that's why we're taking our time going through them. <laughs> that's but why I back, named my son Eliezer. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah. Praise God. It means servant. He's just a servant, right? Yeah. Until a little bit later, you find out his name's Eliezer, which means servant. So it's interesting uh, it says in verse eight, Abraham said, now this is, this is powerful. Uh, he's asking, you know, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse eight, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So he knows that somehow his son is going to be brought back to him, even if he kills him. And God's going to have to do the ultimate provision. In fact, uh, some of, talked about the, the Hebrew grammar there could actually be constructed as God will provide himself as the lamb, which I think is pretty heavy. But at the very least we get out of this, that Abraham knows that God's going to have to do it ultimately. Can't be him. He's going to get some back. And the, But he's a type. He's a picture. Even though he doesn't fully probably understand what's going on here. I don't believe, as some do when it comes to typology, uh, that there's authorial intent. A lot of people, some people believe that when these types are, when when typology is used and what prophets are given, that the prophets knew what they were writing about. Well, actually, it says in First Peter one that they longed to understand what they were yeah, writing about. Amen. They didn't know fully what they were writing about. And if you're certainly Isaac doesn't know what's going on here, you know. <laughs> now Moses actually wrote this, you know, but yeah. how much of it did he know? You know, uh, did he have an encyclopedic version of how everything would be fulfilled? No, you know. And certainly the actors like Abraham and Isaac don't know fully. Abraham has some kind of clue. We, we get more of a clue later. But, but God's orchestrating this through actual people. So it says that Abraham said, God will provide himself the, uh, the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. It's interesting because the father went with Christ to the cross. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar where, uh, where there, uh, there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac. By the way, you can go to the Gospels and you'll see that Jesus was bound. Remember that, you know, he was bound and taken to the cross and he laid him on the altar on the top of the, on, on top of the wood on that same mountaintop guys. Verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But thank God for the, but for Isaac's sake, hmm. right? But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And that is just so powerful. And by the way, he is being tested here, guys, to see if he fears God. God knows in his foreknowledge, but still we have to go through life and everything needs to be revealed. And then in verse 13, it says, Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Mm. Now, Isaac wasn't going to die for the sins of the world, but guess what? We have another picture of Jesus because here a lamb, that's what a ram is with horns, it's a male lamb, is caught in the thickets by the horns. So guess what? What does Abraham see on the head of this male lamb? Not just horns, what else? Thorns. He's caught in the thickets, you know? And... This lamb, who's got a crown of thorns, so to speak, on its head, is taken, this male lamb, and becomes the sacrifice instead of Isaac. 
And Isaac is taken off of the wood, which is a picture, a type of what Christ would do with the father, the father offering his son, his son rising again. This this male lamb becomes another part, another actor, so to speak, not knowing it in this whole scenario where he's a picture of Christ. Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Passover lambs, and we're not getting all that, but all those Passover lambs were a picture of Jesus being sacrificed ultimately. So this male lamb is sacrificed instead of Isaac, and it's very, very touching there. And it's interesting. As we go on, it says in verse 11, Abraham called the name of the place, this is powerful, he called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Check this out. He says, this is this is amazing. Abraham called the name of the place, not the Lord provided, but the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Well, 2,000 years later, the father brought his only begotten son up there, and his son, Jesus, whom he loved, bore the wood on his back. And he was laid on the cross after being bound. And the crown of thorns stuck his head on Mount Moriah, and he was crucified. God didn't stop it didn't stop it because we couldn't be saved if he did stop his son from dying. That's the only way we could be saved. And that's why God gave his son. And Isaac, again, was a picture of Jesus who willingly submitted to his father and was willing to lay his life down, trust his father that much. Jesus trusted his father, and thankfully he rose again. Verse 15, Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. It's emphasized over and over again, folks, not an accident. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as far as, as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is, which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, who is born, has born children to your brother Nahor. And it just goes on. It goes on. And it's, you know, we, you know, verse, uh, chapter, uh, 22, verses 1 through 19 is really the text we wanted to focus on. But you could go right in the next chapters because all of a sudden after this happens and you have a picture of Isaac's resurrection, he disappears for a while. You know, the next time you see him, he's getting his bride. Okay, uh, Jesus has resurrected. He's ascended to the Father. Next time we see him, he'll be getting us his bride. Amen. And guess what? If you're trusting Jesus, if you recognize that you're a sinner, if you recognize that, you know what? Uh, I'm doomed without being saved. You recognize that God gave his son in your place. You put your trust in the Lord Jesus. You repent. You met Noah. You have a change of heart, change of mind, change of will about the direction you're going on. And you're convicted of your sin. You embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, you'll, you'll, pass from death to life and you'll have eternal life and i'm telling you right now guys if you've ever doubted god's word just go through this prophecy it slaps you in the face with love it's like wow god's been at work for years and he's planned this all along and now you can see why i'm saying to you you can even see this in the days of creation because god's very meticulous in his providence but he doesn't forfeit the free agency of the people that he uses to his glory he's just that powerful amen amen You've been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show brought to you by Good Fight Ministries. If you're blessed by this show and would like to partner with us, won't you consider visiting our support page at goodfight.org? Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062, or call us toll-free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. We hope you'll tune in next time on the Good Fight Radio Show.